The name's Ranker. Critical Ranker. And my mission is to play, complete, review, and rank every James Bond title. Stupid cliche intro aside, that is what I plan to do with this series. We're going to play the good, the bad, and everything in between, with the aim of crowning one game with the code name of 007. We're not going to play the games in order, because quite frankly at the moment I don't have the earlier titles. And I plan to do all these playthroughs on real hardware. I will base the order on what you say in the comments. Better get typing. So sit back, relax, grab a martini, and join me in the crossover world of James Bond licensed games. For the first game in the series, we're going to be playing 007 Racing, a game I own but have never actually played. I thought this would be a great jumping off point for this series as I have no nostalgia for this one. So I get to put my critical hat on. This is the exact reason I wanted to do this series. You know what it's like, there's thousands of games to play but there is no drive to pick up these old titles. I'm hoping to get some fun from these old games and hopefully give you guys a reason to give something a go or get your daily dose of nostalgia. So, 007 Racing, released in 2000, the latter end of the PS1's lifespan. In fact, the PS2 was already released in most regions, giving this a relatively high bar to reach. Published by the ever-loved EA and designed by Utechnics. Let's have a little look at what they've been up to. Previously Zeppelin Games, then Merit Studios, based in Newcastle, a UK company, still in business, this is all good. Let's have a little look at what they've made. Oh dear God, this can't be that right to hell. Yeah! We're not going to judge 007 Racing on new Technic's future mistakes, so let's get into the game get this great little cutscene. It may be a bit crushed to hell, but if you're a Bond fan, this will get you ready for the game. Mainly using scenes from the, at the time, current Bosnian films. We get to look at the BMW 750i from Tomorrow Never Dies. The ever awesome Lotus Esprit from The Spy Who Loved Me. The DB5, because of course. We also get a shot of Richard Kill's Jaws, John Cleves, and a perfect scene from Tomorrow Never Dies, where Bond and Q banter about insurance coverage. The destruction with death. All set to a great remix of the 007 theme, which my YouTube overlords tell me I cannot play. Kit says no. It's a great intro. Blow up 007. We have a look through the settings and read the mission screen. We are told our mission is to save the daughter of a diplomat. Charisse Litt and Escape to the Border. This is a point of some criticism for the game. You have to go out your way by reading these mission sections to understand the storyline. This would have been better served in cutscenes, but I understand CGI would have been expensive and time consuming. We start the level and M explains the situation. These visuals are not my setup. This is what the game actually looks like. It's not actually terrible in context. These warping graphics were standard fare for a PS1 due to the system's missing X-axis buffer, MIP mapping and floating point numbers. So even though games were finally fully 3D, you still had to use your imagination to an extent. Escape to the Boulder is a good first level. It teaches you the basic mechanics for the game and it's actually quite fun. It's short and I finished in about 3 minutes. You could probably do it in under two if you knew where to go. One mechanic I noticed that is going to irritate me throughout this playthrough is the weapon changing when you pick up a new item. It stitched me up multiple times and makes the weapon system so clunky. The amount of times in this playthrough I tried to use machine guns and instead ate a missile to the face was too many to count. On a side note, you can use the analog function on the PS1 controller. However, you have to turn it on. I found it much more usable than the D-pad Playing driving games with a D-pad is a past I want to forget. The controls are fine, pretty much in line with the titles of this type. You finish the first level by driving into a helicopter and exploding. I thought I failed, but this is what you're supposed to do apparently. So I suppose we're moving on. Then we get treated to this cutscene. I could be snarky about this, but for the time it was fine. 
Bond's face might be this. But the emotion shown with all three points of articulation on these character models is an art in itself. We get a chase, gadgets and explosions. It's fine. After completing the first level, my immediate reaction was surprise. I honestly have never played this and was expecting a bad racing game because, you know, they called it 007 Racing. But instead, it's far more in line with the driver game, which for me was a pleasant surprise as I loved that game. M gives us a thorough debriefing. She tells us the weapons have been stolen from a NATO shipment, including Q Branch technology and a BMW 750i. M also tells us we're meeting up with the first of the game's film cameos, Jack Wade, although this is not Joe Don Baker. Bond gets into his loan car and receives a phone call from a generic German villain informing him that he is now in a Keanu Reeves speed situation. We have to keep the car moving and collect these pickups to stop the car exploding. This level gave me instant flashbacks to the taxi level in Die Hard, another PS1 title I personally loved. So I'm very much enjoying this so far. We jettison the car into the Hudson River. It explodes and Bond is fine. Luckily, Bond spots the man that gave him the car driving away in a black sedan. Even though he is currently floating in the Hudson River, Bond somehow follows him. Luckily, this all happens between levels. So video game logic, I suppose. At this point, we are met with the first tricky level, Ambush. These kinds of games, just like Driver, are massively based upon repetition. You don't really know what to do in the level until you start playing it. You gradually work out what to do section by section, restarting and getting a little further each time. It's definitely a mechanic to artificially increase the length of the game, but for many, it could become repetitive and tedious. I, on the other hand, find this kind of gameplay addictive, and it really makes me want to have that last go at that level I just cannot beat. Ambush is fine until you come to these bloody forklifts. For some reason, they're immune to rockets, so if you can avoid them flipping you over like a burger, you have to circle them and shoot them in their apparent weak spot on the back. This level did take quite a few tries, and after blowing up the computers with an EMP, we finally complete by driving through a window. On the side note, I'm no scientist, but I'm pretty sure this is not how an EMP works. Anyway, the Matrix already showed us what an EMP looks like. Upon exiting the building, Bond sees a transporter speeding away with reckless regard. After talking to M and Jack Wade, we are introduced to the second film cameo. It's Whisper from Live and Let Die. Apparently he has been building up quite a grudge for our boy while locked up in Attica and has no intention of going quietly. I'm genuinely surprised how much I'm enjoying this game. Perhaps if you have no interest in the Bond films, it wouldn't be the same experience. But I love Bond and weaving these known characters into a serviceable storyline is great fun. This is a nice easy level. It's actually good pacing, giving us a really tricky level followed by a less stressful one. Dare I say, it's actually good game design. We stop the transporter using the DB5's laser to destroy the tires, and after some coercing, Whisper gives us the location he was delivering the shipment to. So, it's off to the Mexican jungle. Survive the jungle isn't a hard level, and it's made easier by beating a pursuing helicopter to the bridges. If you are beaten by the helicopter, it will blow up the bridge and you will have to find a new route. We managed to make all the bridges, pick up the required mines and drive into the truck so we could get delivered to the compound Whisper was driving to. This level very much feels like filler. It isn't bad, it's just okay. However, we do get to drive the BMW Z3, so it's not all bad. After successfully infiltrating the compound, Bond is tasked with blowing up the missile launchers and watchtowers, allowing the CIA air support to destroy the base. Now this level was tricky at first. After grabbing the detonator, it seems triggering the mine does substantial damage to Bond. And with 10 to destroy, health was becoming a problem. After some practice, you can work out the timing and speed off without taking much damage, if any. Once the missile launchers are disabled, you take out the watchtowers with Stinger missiles and use the laser target on the building to call the CIA. The doors open 
and it's Valentin Sokovsky. Great stuff. I loved it when Robbie Coltrane returned to Sokovsky in The World Is Not Enough, so seeing him here is a real treat. I get caught up with these bulldozers, leading to a retry and eventually escape to safety. This is another level where the game knows what it wants you to do, but working that out isn't massively intuitive, so a few tries are necessary. We find out from Zukowski, he has started a legitimate automobile distribution service with Koskov. Yes, that Koskov, the general from the Living Daylights. Zukowski tells us he was taken captive when he refused to be part of a weapon and smallpox smuggling operation. The smallpox was stolen from the Institute of Viral Preparations in Moscow, in concert with an unknown third party. This will be relevant later. And yes, I see the opportunity to insert a topical witty quip about the virus that shall not be named, but I will leave it to you guys in the comments. The next level, Escape, is another racing level. While trying to escape the compound, Bond is pursued by General Koskov. It's a simple level. Keep on track, collect the homing beacons and parachute, and drive off the cliff. This does have a strange appearance from a red Ferrari F355, which you need to race throughout the level. It's strange because it's clearly a reference to Xenia on the top from Goldeneye, even down to the banter between the two. I can't find any reference to her in the game, and of course, she was very much dead by the end of Goldeneye, so I'm a little confused. Nevertheless, the race is not hard. Just remember to use the parachute when driving off the cliff, because I forgot. Reading the text in between the levels, we find out the shocking, but not so shocking twist in the story. Bond is captured by none other than Jaws, and while being held captive, the evil mastermind is revealed. Charisse Litt shows herself from the shadows, and the man behind it all was Charisse's father, diplomat Dr. Hammond Litt. The opening mission was a red herring, and Dr. Litt plans on using the Q-Branch carbon conversion technology for something notorious. Left locked away with Dr. Melody Chase, Bond cleverly uses a remote control to drive the Q-Branch car, watching through the security cameras. This is an innovative setup for a level, especially in a Bond game, but the execution is terrible. This level officially wins my worst level ever in this series award. I hate it. Honestly, it's terrible. The controls are frustrating, the changing camera angles are inconsistent, and the physics of the car is awful. I have never seen a car perform this nifty little manoeuvre after driving off of a two-foot wall. We need to drop the mines in these circles and then escape with the aid of the magnet. To make things even worse, the first time I completed it, my percentage was too low. So we're doing it again, and I was on the edge. Bringing up another mechanic about this game that perplexes me. Rating the player's performance in the level is fine. Many games did it, and it gives a game replay value. However, you should not be able to fail missions based on the final percentage score. If you complete the level within the objectives the game sets, you should pass no matter how low your score. I was genuinely shocked when I finally completed this horrible level and then failed because reasons. Next, we move on to River Race. Bond and Dr. Chase escape the warehouse, but so have Jaws and Cherise Lit, and they are rapidly escaping on a power boat. We chase them as we need information about Cherise's father, and for anyone that has played this game, you will know my pain. This is a hard level. If you happen to make it through the stage, with Jaws launching these persistent mortars with surgical precision, you then have to hit the boat you are chasing four times with sniper rockets. It's tedious, but my god it's addictive. Halfway through the level, we get patched into the local police radio, and the sheriff responding to the mortar fire, speeding sports car, and apparently a kidnapping, is none other than J.W. Pepper, in all his redneck stereotypical glory. We haven't seen him since the man with the golden gun, and it's a great callback. I get this clutch final shot on the boat, and the level is done. I finished this level at 3am in the morning, and I just couldn't go to bed until I beat it. Bond stops the boat, and just as he goes to apprehend Lit and the metal mouth behemoth, good old Sheriff Pepper with backup in tow pull up to the scene. Cherise uses her charm and diplomatic connections to convince the Sheriff she is innocent, and it was in fact Bond that had drugged and kidnapped Melody Chase. Lit is given custody of Dr. Chase, 
and her and Jaws escape in the black limo. This is great because it's fully in line with J.W. Pepper's bungling character. As Bond is being taken away, Jack Wade appears and stops Bond's arrest. Not being able to interrogate Charisse, the only lead we have is a CIA report that Hammond Litt's car operation in New York has been showing some activity. So, it's off to the Big Apple for James Bond. The objective of this level is to get close to Hammond's cars and use the device from Q Branch to download the information from their computers. You have to stay at a certain range while the downloads are in progress. And if you are spotted, the mission is failed. This level is neither challenging nor interesting. It's very meh. Any difficulty comes from the random movements of the cars we are pursuing, and it feels very cheap. We finish the mission, and it's on to a much better level. Using the information downloaded and cross-referencing it, with NATO's low-frequency harp array, MI6 have located a secret under-ocean base. And you know what that means. It's time for the Lotus Esprit. I don't know what it is about the Esprit, but as a kid, it was always my favourite. I love this level. It's a real callback to the classic Bond, Evil Les. We dodge the laser-guided guns using the infrared goggles. Save Dr. Chase with this nifty little move. Plant the bomb next to the big machine and then escape while grabbing these antidotes. We even get this awesome explosion cutscene while escaping. This was my favourite level. And the crowning glory is I finished on top of the leaderboard. Unlocking my first cheat. Yes, blue goggles instead of red. Yeah, underwhelming. And it is certainly no paintball mode in Goldeneye. The game doesn't directly tell you, but I gather Charisse died in the explosion. And apparently Hammond Litt escaped in a small sub. What a great dad. It turns out Litt's been attaching the virus to car exhausts, which is already put into public circulation. The virus will kill the infected within a week, and he plans to sell the inoculation to selected world leaders and create a new world order. He is going to trigger this via satellite, and it's up to Bond to stop him. MI6 have tracked Dr. Litt to his private airstrip, and he is already on the plane, making his getaway. In our final mission, we have to take out these four engines individually before the plane builds up speed. No high-tech gadgets here. We have to crash into the engines like a racer boy in a town centre on a Friday night. Again, this isn't hard, it's irritating. Get too far in front or behind the engines and your health drops rapidly. So after finally managing to take out all four engines in the same run, the car stalls and the plane turns around to ground Bond into the airstrip. Using the rocket sniper from earlier, we shoot the wheels twice and escape the explosion by driving into the ocean. God, I love the Esprit. The final cutscene rolls. Bond escapes the explosion with Dr. Chase and takes full advantage of the situation, because of course he does. They sail off into the sunset, and in true Bond style, we are informed Bond will return. There is further content to be played. You can replay in double-O agent mode, or top the scoreboards in individual levels to unlock cheats. However, after the terrible reward I got in the level submerged, I have no plans on doing that. There is also a generic two-player battle arena mode, with two options, pass a bomb, and challenge. Surprisingly, my teenage kids have no interest in being pulled away from their Team Fortresses 2 and Fortnites to play this average 22-year-old game, so I can't really rate it. One thing that has disappointed me that I have to mention is the cars. I love the fault of driving the iconic Bond cars, but in this game, they all drive exactly the same. I'm sure they have some sort of a stat difference, but I would imagine a 1.9-litre coupe Z3 and a 5.4-litre V8 Mustang drive considerably different. With all that being said, let's rank it. The graphics were not close to groundbreaking at the time, and without upscaled emulated visuals, this is not a pretty game, and is a little rough on the old eyes. Mechanics were much better than I expected. The gameplay was fun, and the controls were serviceable. There was also some really well-designed missions here. The sound is not great. Having voice acting from John Cleves and good remixes of the Bond theme definitely adds points, but all the sampling quality is low and it's a little grating. The story is the best bit. I'm a massive Bond fan, 
and this story definitely kept my interest. They stuffed as many cameos as they could in here and definitely made it fun for fans of the franchise. I'm not going to lie, if you can't see past the limitations of the PS1, you are going to struggle with this one. But for anyone that can, this is somewhat of a diamond in the rough. I give 007 Racing the final score of 61%. This game thoroughly falls in the category of weekend rental. And if you're into Bond, it's definitely worth a play. The game only took four hours to complete and I don't feel it was time wasted in any way. I can see why people have nostalgia for this one and after seeing this game on worst ever lists, I was surprised with how much fun I had. It's very much in line with Driver and I found it very addictive. All that being said, I have no drive to 100% 007 racing. A single playthrough was more than enough for me, probably just a sign of the time, as I'm sure I would have loved grinding this back in the day. This game is definitely more Welcome, my team. Shaken, not stirred. Other than <laughs> Thank you so much if you made it this far in the video. I had fun with this game and I hope you enjoyed the video. Do you enjoy this game back in the day? Does it bring back nightmares you had long since forgotten? Let me know in the comments below. I'm going to be covering loads of retro games in the future, both popular titles and not so well known ones like this. So if you enjoy this kind of content, please consider subscribing for future videos and I'll see you next time.